Hello everyone, I am Enrico Lucinat from the University of Bologna and the Magnetic Resonance Center in Florence. In the second part, I will show you how to prepare a sample of human cells for in-cell NMR analysis. So at CERN we have developed a few years ago um, an approach uh, which makes use of uh, human cells to directly overexpress the protein of interest inside these cells. We use HEC293 T cells, which are uh, very robust cells, relatively quick to grow and can be easily transfected, to perform transient transfection with uh, many copies of uh, gene containing the protein of interest, and then inducing uh, constitutive expression through a very strong, a very active uh, promoter. And uh, during protein expression, we use, we replace the growth medium with an isotope labeled growth medium. In this way, the protein of interest is isotopically enriched with the isotopes that you want to use for observing from, for NMR. Then after, after the expression, then we collect the cells and perform the NMR. This uh, uh, has a very, uh, compared to other protein delivery technique, has the advantages that you can observe Pro, uh, physiological processes such as protein maturation or redox state changes directly on cytosolic proteins which were synthesized in the cell. And uh, it does not require any uh, protein expression, purification and manipulation prior to insertion in the cells that could lead to artifacts in the sense that proteins can be sensitive to the conditions in vitro, could be very prone to aggregation. So in this way you can let the cells express the protein and then you directly observe the outcome. Uh, now there is another tutorial that will show you how we grow the cells and perform this transient transfection. So I will uh, go quickly summarize these steps and then show you how we collect the cells and then prepare the actual NMR samples. So the transient protein expression protocol consists very quickly on a cell growth phase in which we, we, we first grow the cells, then uh, after 24 hours we perform a transient transfection with the DNA, at the same time we switch the growth medium uh, and we replace the unlabeled medium with the labeled medium. Then protein expression goes on for about two days, it can also be three days. Uh, we have observed we reach the highest uh, expression level after two or three days. At that point we collect the cells for NMR. This is how we prepare the sample. So first we need to detach the cells from the flask and uh, to do so we trypsinize cells. So this, uh, all this preparation from the flask to the tube requires about one hour. First uh, you need to remove the spent medium from the flask, then you wash the cells twice with 7 ml uh, of PBS for each wash and then you detach the cells with, by adding two milliliters of trypsin EDTA. Now you place the trypsin on, you, you, you cover the monolayer of uh, the cells with trypsin, and then you incubate for five minutes at room temperature. Now, sometimes we have observed that trypsin for transfected cells, it may be, uh, it, it may take longer to detach the cells. So if necessary, if you observe this, then you can incubate the cells at 37 degrees in the CO2 incubator for a few more minutes. And that should work to detach, fully detach the cells. So at this point, you, you pipe a 20 ml of complete uh, DMEM medium that is needed to inactivate trypsin, which otherwise would harm your cells. At this point, you can collect the cells with a serological pipette and put them in a 50 ml falcon tube. Now you spin down these cells at 800 G for five minutes at room temperature centrifuge, and then you discard the supernatant. Then you have a pellet. You wash this pellet to remove traces of medium and trypsin uh, with, the, with 10 ml of PBS. And then you spin them down again for five minutes at room temperature, and then you discard the supernatant. Then finally, you can bring this falcon with the cell pellet to the NMR lab or to a lab closer to the NMR, in our case, and then you transfer these cells into an Eppendorf tube, a 1.5 mL Eppendorf tube. To do so, I usually take some fresh DMEM medium, very low amount, with a 
with a Gilson with a micropipette, for example, 150 microliters, and then I carefully resuspend the cells at the bottom of the tube to make a very uh, dense uh, cell suspension, and then I pipette all of this suspension into the NMR tube, in, in, sorry, into the Eppendorf tube, and then I spin down the tube at 800G for a few minutes, even two minutes is enough, then discard, and then I have a nice pellet in the Eppendorf tube, this pellet here. Now it's time to resuspend this pellet into the NMR buffer. The NMR buffer is nothing more than DMAM, but we change the composition of DMAM to take into account some effect that you otherwise would have in the NMR sample. So we first supplement this DMAM with 70 millimolar HEPAS final concentration in order to stabilize the pH, and then we add 90 millimolar of glucose, so that uh, in this way to, we compensate for the high cell density uh, in the NMR tube, because cells would, uh, would metabolize glucose very quickly. Then on top of that, we add 20% of D2 offset so that when you mix this buffer with the cell pellet you will end up with a, a, a cell suspension with about 10% D2O which is good for the locking the, uh, the, 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 the NMR spectrometer. Now there is one catch. You, we need to remove the, uh, the bicarbonate containing DMAM because normal DMAM is buffered with the CO2 and uh, bicarbonate which works well into the um, CO2 atmosphere that you have in the incubator. There is 5% CO2 in the, in the atmosphere in the incubator. However, if you use this buffer in an NMR tube and then you close it and you keep the cells in a non-controlled atmosphere, uh, you will have uh, the formation, you will see that there are CO2 bubbles forming in the NMR tube. So to avoid this, uh, we need to remove the CO2 from the buffer, and we do this after the HEPAS addition. So after you added the HEPAS powder and dissolved it, you will see that the medium turns yellow because the pH went uh, to a lower uh, decreased. So to, to remove CO2 at this point, we bubble air for around 10 minutes. It's easy to see that you have removed the CO2 because the pH will uh, go back to 7, 7.5, and the, the medium will turn back to a red color. So now that we have this buffer ready, we resuspend the cell pellet with the uh, 180 microliters of NMR buffer. We slowly pipe it because cells don't like to be pipetted too quickly, otherwise they would die. Then we first, of, before putting them in the NMR tube, we take 10 microliters of this cell suspension to measure that is, and we put it aside, that is useful to measure cell viability by Trifan Blue, and then can be even used to run them on a gel and see and check the protein levels by SDS page, for example. Now that you have the suspension, you can go on with the sample preparation, you can transfer it to the NMR tube. Now we normally use 3 millimeter Shigemi tubes. Shigemi tubes are a special type of uh, glass tubes, which have a, a chamber separated uh, from the bottom through, from, by a, a thick uh, plug of, uh, of glass at the bottom of the tube. And then there is uh, another component, which is a glass plunger that is a plunger, sorry, that is um, inserted normally in, this, in, the, in the NMR tube. In this way, it creates a, a small chamber where you have a, a very small volume of sample, and that covers perfectly the uh, NMR active volume uh, in the spectrometer. So this is a useful way to uh, work uh, with the limited amounts of sample, which is our case. So that's how, how, why we use Shigemi tubes. And uh, what we do at this point is we take uh, this uh, cell suspension, we pipette it with a long um, Pasteur pipette, Make sure that the glass is not too thin like a capillary, otherwise you would squeeze your cells and kill them. So and make sure that this uh, pasteur pipe uh, is wide enough, uh, still not too wide that it, it needs to fit in the 3 millimeter NMR tube. So then you pipe it your suspension to the, directly to the bottom, slowly directly to the bottom of the Shigemi tube. And you get this, you, you, you end up with, with this. So you have a nice cell suspension at the bottom of the Shigemi tube. Now, do not use the plunger. So you don't need to put this glass plunger 
here. I'll show you why. You just close the tube with the standard cap. Next step, we make the cell, we make a soft cell pellet at the bottom of the tube. This would happen anyways because these cells do not stay afloat, they would settle down by themselves in a few minutes. So we normally um, make it quicker by spinning slowly this uh, tube with a with a hand operated centrifuge. Very classic for spinning down uh, NMR samples. So in, in about three minutes, uh, if you spin down the cells, then you would get a nice cell pellet or sediment, and then you will see the supernatant at the top of the tube. That is why we don't use the plunger, because the supernatant can act as a plunger. The pellet will stay exactly where the NMR coil is in the instrument, and you will have reduced to the least amount the sample, the, the, the volume of cells that you need to do the NMR. So, uh, sample size and choice of NMR tube. I have shown this uh, with a 3 mm tube, but you could use 4 mm or 5 mm if you have uh, a 5 mm NMR probe. So you could fit all of these sizes. Uh, however, that depends on how many cells you have. So in, uh, in our lab, we use uh, T75 flasks and they contain at confluence around uh, 3 times 10 to the 7 cells, which is 30 million cells. And for hex cells, that means that we get a pellet of this size, which is perfect for a 3 millimeter Shigemi tube. If we had uh, more cells, and a probe that does not suffer from uh, uh, radiation damping due to the high ionic strength of the sample. You could also use uh, thicker tubes, like four or five millimeters. Now, in this way, we have prepared an NMR sample that, in our experience, for the proteins that are expressed to the highest possible levels, Con will contain uh, on average, so in the total sample volume, around 150 molar protein concentration, which is more than enough to observe protein signals in uh, minutes and few hours. That will depend, however, on how the, the protein will behave inside the cell. So the detection limit, uh, uh, well, first of all, if this protein concentration is too much, it's very easy to produce cell samples which express less protein. Because at the time of transfection, instead of transfecting with pure DNA containing um, vector containing the gene of interest, you can dilute the gene by mixing the vector with a gene of interest and an empty vector that does not contain any gene. In this way, you will still transfect all of the cells but they will express, they have less copies of gene and then they will express at lower levels. And that you can, this can be easily seen here by the Western blot. So these are the dilutions of the vector with empty vector. And you see that you still get overexpression, but at lower and lower levels. Now the detection limit for NMR is really protein dependent because it depends on the tumbling rate of the protein and it depends whether your protein is a globular stably folded protein or is an IDP. So typically for folded proteins, even as low as few tens of micromolar of protein can be detected at 900 or 950 megahertz. However, if the protein is an IDP, then you can have a detection limit as low as few micromolar because it will give rise to sharper signals. Now, these are uh, re reference that, I mean, these values are relative to the one hour long so fast HMQC that we normally acquire. I will show you later. 